and welcome to another edition of the Guna Ramble, an Arsenal Fan TV podcast. Um, on this week's show, we, it's where we go behind enemy lines, where we interview a fan from our Arsenal's next opponents. Um, joining me will be a regular panellist, Akil. Hello, Akil. How are you doing, mate? Hello. Yeah, all good. Thank you. Good stuff. Right. Good man. Um, we're, we're, you, you were over um, last week's um, debacles and trials and tribulations. We're, we're looking forward to Saturday, aren't we? Well, yeah, I'm over it, but, I'm, <laughs> but I could be back under it tomorrow at some nine o'clock. But yeah, 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 let's see what happens. That's it. PMA, as I said in the WhatsApp group, isn't it? Yeah. Positive mental attitude. It's good to see that you Oh, is that what that meant? Oh, yeah. wonderful, actually. I've been trying to work it out for the last three days. All right, well, there you go. Yeah. There you go, mate. Um, so joining us uh, tonight will be um, he's, he's a writer, he's a correspondent, a Manchester, Manchester City correspondent for Bleacher Report. He's also the editor of a typical City blog, and he also writes for the Daily Mirror Online. We've got Rob Pollard. Good evening, Rob. Good evening. Thanks for coming on, mate. No problem. Thanks for having me. No problems. Right. Um, let's kick off by um, asking you. You know, how your season's gone? How, how do you feel it's progressed? Uh, yeah, it's been really good. It's been really enjoyable. I think the quality of the football we played, um, certainly up until the end of January, is the best that I've seen. I've uh, been following City for, I don't know, probably 25 years, something like that. And the football we played up until the 5-1 win away at Spurs, which was the you know the last game of January, um, was the best I've ever seen. I mean, it has tailed off a little bit, um, but then in the last week we've we've kicked back on again, and 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 the forms, uh, you know, the forms back. We've already got a trophy in the bag, as well, which is nice, and we qualified for the uh, knockout stages of the Champions League for the first time after failing twice. So I would say that overall, at this stage, uh, it's been yeah, it's been a great season. I've really enjoyed it. Mm. You've also you've already qualified for Europe next season, isn't it? So if all else goes wrong, you've got the Europa League, isn't it? That's that's a that's a banker, isn't oh, it? Oh, that's a banker. <laughs> yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, it, um, you know, can I ask at the start of the season? At the start of the season, Man United coming to the season as champions. Yeah. Who did you see as your main title rivals? And I want you to be as honest as you can. Um, United, um, Chelsea. And Arsenal. Did you actually see us as main main rivals? Yeah, they were the three who I certainly thought Liverpool have surprised me. I'm going to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not expect them to make such a sustained challenge, and obviously United have surprised me massively with where they've ended up. I didn't think they would be, you know, they they won the league by 11 points last last season, didn't they? Which was was a nice nice and comfortable for them, and I didn't expect it to be as comfortable as that. But I certainly didn't expect them to be where they are. I think he, you know he's done it. He's it's been disastrous from from David Moyes. But yeah, I definitely thought Arsenal would be uh, one of our main challenges for sure. Even right. we didn't think Arsenal <laughs> would be challenging. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of yeah, it's, it, was, it was a nice, it really was a nice turn up for the books until until Stoke, wasn't it? And then it kind of really came off the rails last weekend at Chelsea. But um, you know, it was, it was I was really enjoying the season, the roller coaster ride. You know, um, I didn't have really any expectations except being within single digits of the eventual champions. But um, last I don't know, this this month of March has been kind of up, up and down, and last week has been quite quite um, harrowing. Yeah, the last so. week has been bad, but you 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 normally implode earlier than this, don't you? Well, that's what so, yeah, that's what the media say, you know, and um, so, so stats and facts would, would would lend support to that. But um, I think you I think you've improved, haven't you? That would be my assessment. You know, you've if, if, the way I look at it, if you win the FA Cup and finish in the top four again, I don't know. I think that's a I think that's a decent season for Arsenal, and they can kick on. You, I'm sure. Arsenal's going to spend a bit, bit of money at some point, isn't he? Well, yeah, we started last year, but fans are saying it's not enough. Um, you know, especially as uh, how, how things have turned out, we've we've kind of overused uh, Olivier Giroud because we've, we've not really had any alternative. Unlike yourselves, you've had you've got four strikers. You hardly use uh, Stefan Jovetic, who we were said to be in for at the beginning of the summer. You wouldn't release the Edin Dzeko, and he's done quite well stepping in for um, Aguero. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think that? 
it, you need four strikers you know, in a season. It depends what um, system you play. I mean, Arsenal only play with one true striker, so you could probably get away with three. Uh, whereas we started this, I mean, only in the last sort of fortnight have we gone to just one man up front, and that's been enforced really. But we were playing two up top for for the majority of the season, and I think in that scenario you need four. Uh, but we got away with three really because Jovetic has been out for the majority of the season, so we've pretty much I think he's played twelve games or something. Um, so we've pretty much gone the majority of the season with just three. Um, we've we've sort of got away with that really. Mm. Um, you say that you've kind of you, you, you've kind of um, got back on the horse, or you've you sort of like you know you, you've you, you, you've you've sort of like you know got got, got back on the title trail. I mean, yeah. um, did it did it kind of go a bit awry when you know you were playing uh, Wigan and you lost in the semi final or the quarter finals to Wigan and yeah. you, you lost company, didn't you? And Aguero was out injured. And yeah, it, it definitely it seems like a case of squad is God, isn't it? Yeah, it derailed us a little bit, but the, mm. the, the win at Hull, we, we, we beat Hull 2-0, company was sent off inside 10 minutes, and I think there was a lot of City fans who were sat there at that stage thinking, well, that's the title over, um, but then news filtered through that it was only a one-match ban, and then we beat them, and we were we were so good that day, I mean, that's my favourite win of the season, the Hull win, and just since then, it's just reignited everything for us, but I, I, your point about the squad is something I have noticed with City, at the start of the season, I think everybody was going on and what a great squad we have and everything else. But actually, it's not as good as people think. We've got seven, we've got a core of seven players who are world class, which is more than most people in the Premier League. So I'm not, I'm certainly not complaining. But beyond those, when we're missing one, two, maybe three of those, we do actually struggle because the players coming in are, are uh, you know, we've, we've got a few weak areas basically that sort of need filling in. Okay, um, I want to ask you about before I go over to hand over to Axe, I want to ask you about how do you, what kind of job do you think Manuel Pellegrini's done so far? Because you know uh, there was a lot of it was it was quite a tumultuous end for um, Man- Mancini. Yeah. Wasn't it? I mean he, he I thought he'd done quite well. He did. At Man- he had to go. I mean I, I've speak to a few people at the club uh, from sort of head of media down to the kit man and everything else and. They have all said the same thing that he just completely lost the dressing room. Not just the dressing room, actually, but the the whole staff. You know, there was there was you could count on one hand the amount of people involved in the playing staff and the wider sort of technical staff and everything else who actually liked him at the end. Um, and there was an interesting anecdote. I mean, I won't name the player because I don't think I should. But there was one player who is very much considered a, an excellent pro, uh, and he told. Um, the staff at the club that you know he didn't want to do interviews anymore because he didn't want to be in a position where he to criticise the manager and whatnot. And I think he just he had to go. And I think Pellegrini's come in and done a great job. I think that the club, he suits what the board want and what the club want. They want someone first and foremost who's willing to work in the director of football setup uh, without complaint. And Pellegrini does that, whereas Mancini would break ranks and was sort of slagging off Brian Marwood when he didn't land the players that he wanted and stuff like that. Pellegrini's never going to do that. So I think first and foremost, they like that. And then second of all, they they want an, a, an attractive brand of football being played. Uh, and Pellegrini is just, you know, throughout his career, he's just been absolutely true to that. He's never, ever deviated uh, even at City, when the, a few of the few of the results early on went went wrong away from home, I think we we drew it. Uh, we got beat by Cardiff and Villa and Chelsea, and we drew at Stoke, and it was really threatening to derail uh, all the good work we were doing at home. He just stuck to his guns, and we just carried on playing this attacking style away from home, and he said it up bearing fruit, or you know it has done so far. So I think though a combination of those two things make him a really attractive prospect to the owners and the board and uh, even if we don't win the league my uh, hunch is my impression is is that he's going to get another season at least cool. alright uh, Akil yeah it was, I mean Mancini seemed quite well loved to be honest as I said every time we came to City you know his sort of song was sung by yeah. fans. and So, I mean, yeah, perhaps players at the end, he lost the dressing room, but do you think he really lost the fans? Were fans quite no, the fans loved happy. Him. Yeah, the they fans were probably quite, 
disappointed to see him go, but maybe understood why he had to go. Well, no, I think a lot of them didn't understand, and I think no. that's the problem. I think that the, the club faced a really difficult situation. They, On the one hand, it was so bloody obvious to everybody inside the club that he had to go. So it was not even a decision anymore. The, he, it was just, it was done, you know, he was going. But then on the other hand, they knew that there was such strong f- feeling towards the manager from the fans. So they had to reconcile this. And it must have been really, really difficult for the club officials and everything else to make that transition. And uh, there is, I mean, there's a section of supporters who have not taken to Pellegrini. And the reason they've not taken to Pellegrini is because he was the man to immediately follow our hero, you know, the guy, yeah. who, the guy who ended our 35-year wait for a major piece of silverware. He yeah. ended our 44-year wait for a league title. I mean, he is loved at City. Yeah, um, you got know, into so they, Europe as well, of course. Got into Europe. So, yeah, I mean, Mancini did a good job. There was two and a half years of constant progression, but then there was a year at the end where we went backwards and he paid the price for that. It's, it's funny because I remember the, the statement. Or the, I'm not sure if I, I'm not wording it verbatim, but it was something like he didn't. He failed in his targets to meet, and as it was x amount of trophies in within x amount of years or something like that. Was that the official line? Was that? Is it something to do with that? I can't. To be honest, I can't remember what the statement said. I just remember that the the word holistic was used. That's it, holistic. And they <laughs> they basically wanted someone who was going to come in and oversee everything and. Mancini was Mancini was absolute. Just the first eleven was all he was concerned with. Whereas they wanted someone to come in and sort of work alongside Vieira, who was in charge of the the youth setup, and say, look, this is the style that the first team are playing. So we want the young lads to be playing the same style, and you know that kind of thing. Whereby there was more. Every part of the club was linking up a bit more. Mancini was just first team focused and I think they wanted someone who was a little bit more uh, malleable than that and also it wasn't going to like I mentioned earlier it wasn't going to be breaking ranks and criticising people at the club and whatnot. Uh, I think that really really upset quite a few of them mm. OK cool let's get back to Arsenal Arsenal City um, we went there earlier on in this season we yeah. were we were quite we were, we were doing quite well up until that point and um you know, we, we went to City of Manchester Stadium, um, and it, it, six three seems like we got our artists served yeah. to us. But I, I thought it was a it was a lot more entertaining. I thought it was a better game than what the scoreline suggested. It was a great I mean, how game. did you? It was a great it was, game. It was one of the best of the season, wasn't it? In terms of you know, I'd say it was, sort of. I'd say it was one of the best in the history of the Premier League. I mean, I, I mean that sounds like quite a a big statement. And there's been a lot of great games, but I'd say it was up there. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, the thing that was with us that day, we we did look like we could score at will because that was at the height of our best form. We went on a run of 20 games unbeaten in December and January, and you caught us right in the midst of that. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it was a great game, and yeah, I, th- I agree with you that Arsenal were probably better than the scoreline suggested. Um, at that point, we were, the, we were the only team to have gone there and actually scored three, weren't we? Because I think no one had actually put three in your net. Um, at, at your stadium up, up until that point, yeah. right, le- domestically yeah. speaking, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's the I, thing. I, I think I think we we look like we could score a lot as well. I mean, if I remember rightly, we had two goals that were disallowed, which for on another day, you know, might not have been. I think um, when Giroud had one, when he, he was flagged offside quite early, but he took the shot and it was right in the corner. Nick Despentner came on. I think we had a penalty shout as well. That was yeah. was, was quite, quite dodgy. I think yeah. I remember for the City third or fourth goal, there was a you know alleged foul from Sanya on Nasri, which gave City the ball. And then they sort of a couple of minutes later scored a goal. So I think it was a it wasn't a six three to be honest. I mean it's it, it, our sort of big games at big grounds are talked about a lot, but I think. The City game was totally different to the Chelsea or Liverpool game because in those two yeah. games we just yeah. we were out of class. But City, I'm not sure we were. You know, we got it back to one one, and then I think was it two two, was it three two? I can't remember. Three two, yeah, two. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah, with you that the exactly. City game was not like those two other two that you mentioned. I agree. You were you were competitive yeah. in, in the game with us, and I don't know. Yeah, it was. It was a it was a great game to me. It was just two sides who believed in their attacking ability who just went at each other for 90 minutes and I don't know it was thoroughly enjoyable 
even for me, I mean, for a neutral, that must have been absolutely fantastic game. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And that, Indeed. That, that was, as you said, you know, with Mancini's defensive style, that was actually, it was, it was different for us because we usually came to City or when you guys came to us, it was always City. It was quite a defensive performance from City. I remember a couple of years ago when you literally played 10 men behind the ball and then oh, Carlos yeah. Tevez, the poor lad, just basically chasing them. He did quite well, to be fair. But it was, she was just chasing the ball, and I think the game finished nil nil. I think that's the year you got into Europe for the first time. Um, yeah. And it was just so dull. It was City were just. I mean, that's when I think City got a lot of criticism because they'd spent a lot of money and they came out and done that. But obviously, it was a progression, you know. And a few years on, you're obviously now playing the football you guys want to see, and you're you're also successful. So yeah, you know, yeah. Set you up the football this year. At City, for the for the most part, has just been fantastic. It really has. It's been so enjoyable to follow this year, and that's what you want, isn't it? As a fan, I mean, obviously success is great, and it's what we're all sort of aiming for. But you want to be entertained, and Pellegrini's just absolutely delivered where that's concerned. Yeah, I mean, we first I first came across him when he was at was, it, was he at Villarreal? We, yeah, we played them in the semi final yeah. of the Champions League one year, and um, they had um, Raquel me and all those players, Marcus, yeah. and you could tell he was a football. He was a football man, wasn't he? He, yeah. he likes good football, attacking football, which is it, when you look at him, he's very different from the kind of person he looks like. Do you know, what I mean, he, does, yeah. he looks quite pragmatic. He speaks quite pragmatically, yes. you know, and yeah, you expect a sort of tight disciplinarian type guy don't you but he's just yeah. so yeah and he says it really openly because I go to the press conferences at Carrington on a Friday and every week he makes the point of saying I believe in this way of playing and I want us to play that way for 90 minutes the amount of times he's tried to get that line out there almost like a politician who tries to get a really important sound bite about you know cutting this for the economy or whatever he does the same thing um, about this style of play and this uh, you know playing this playing the same way from the first minute to the last and he, he's really tried to sort of get that message out there that that's what he believes and um, you know he's really been true to that he, he really has now you've poached a few players out from us over the years yeah. you? over the recent years um, yeah. it's, we've also, it's almost been like we've been a feeder school for you guys well, there's <laughs> another one now it looks like we're going yeah. to get um, Sad, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, um, how, how, how much how much truth do you, do you put in that I mean how much I mean you, you like you say you, you, you're close to the media or uh, you know and what goes on at, at, at Man City what's the feeling what's the yeah I've not to be honest it was first mentioned uh, today at the press conference but I didn't ask any other journalist if they had heard anything, to be honest. I was in a bit of a rush. I mean, they did ask Pellegrini, but he just did the, the old, you know, there's been that many names mentioned, I'm not going to talk about them kind of thing. My well, he, 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 can't, he can't say anything because yeah, legally, really, because you're, yeah. not, you're not allowed to talk to Bakary Sammy. Like, he's not allowed to talk to anyone in England. So if Pellegrini has admitted anything, that, yeah. would be, that would be an FA charge or however. It so. makes sense on the surface, though, I've got to be honest, because we've, um, Micah Richards has had um, so many problems that this year he's hardly played. He's played, he's, played twice in the league for example which obviously is um, you know minimal involvement so I think that we need a, a right back but whether we need one of the quality of um, Sanya is, is another another issue because we're going to have yeah. two, probably going to have the two if he did come we would have arguably the two best right backs in the league you know so exactly so Pablo Zabaleta has been quite he's, I mean he kind of for me he kind of was under the radar I mean he was always solid and steady and whatnot. but look watching him this season especially uh, uh, in the um, Arsenal game up there he was fantastic oh, yeah. I really started taking notice and I thought well, he, not only is he a good defender but actually going forward oh, as well he, ne he never used to be either when he first came under Mark Hughes Mark Hughes played him in midfield for a start which is typical Hughes did, Hughes did that with him and Vincent Company. he played Zavaletti in midfield and company in midfield and you know they're absolutely fantastic centre back and right back but that's Mark Hughes all over but about Pablo Zavaletti when he first came he was we all loved him like the City fans talked to him straight away because he was like running around like a madman and challenging you know f throwing himself his body on the line left right and but he wasn't actually a great player uh, he was a liability, always thought he could get sent off, he got beat in one-on-one -on -one situations very easily, we just loved him because of his attitude, but the last two years, last season, uh, he was our player of the year by 
considerable distance and this year again he's just been absolutely phenomenal the last two years he has come on so much and I just don't see a better right back I mean maybe I'm obviously biased you know I'm sure I am but I just I don't know how you could get better than that guy he's so reliable defensively and like you say the improvements he's made going forward has just been incredible to watch and he's also he's more than that he's like a, a leader um, in the dressing room and he, he's a cult He's got cult status with the fans, and he's like an honorary Mancunian and everything. He's just perfect in every way, that guy. We absolutely love him. All right, so um, who are, apart from Zabaleta and companies back now, who are your other threats going you know, that, that we should look out for? Well, you won't like me saying this, but <laughs> Samir Nasri has been outstanding this season because, I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit that at the end of last season I would have been happy to see him go um, because he'd, he was I mean he was dreadful last year he spent the whole season on the periphery of matches um, jumping out of the way of free kicks and whatnot. and then this year I, honest to God I'm, in all my years watching football I've never seen someone turn their form around so considerably he's gone from being a player you would have singled out as one you wanted to leave to a guy who's in the top three or four performers in the squad but then the other player you've got to watch is David Silva who is the I, best player we've ever had I think he's absolutely he's, he's different class he's oh, different mustard God, isn't he he's just I just I can't I struggle to put it into words with that guy and it's interesting I mean like I said I've been following City sort of 20-25 years he's definitely the best player I've seen and everybody of my age says the same but at the end of the United better, game, than, better than Georgie Kinkladzi yeah he's better than King. I mean Kinkladzi <laughs> lit up a very dull period and that's why we love him but obviously if he was next to Silver today he, he wouldn't be anywhere near as good I mean Kinkladzi was a very good player don't get me wrong but nothing on Silver but it was interesting after I went to the I went to Old Trafford on Tuesday and in the away end and at the end of the game there was guys who have of 40 and 50 saying the same that he is the best that they've seen um, and they are their people who saw Lee Bell some of the all those sort of city greats that roll off the tongue and even they were saying this guy is the best player I've seen uh, in a blue shirt and he, he's just he just he's just so important to every everything that we do and I regularly say on Twitter you know he's he is the most important attacking player uh, that we have and Fans of City all agree, or nearly all agree, and fans of other clubs always say, what about Aguero? And it's like, yeah, Aguero's great, he really is, he's fam he's one of the best strikers in Europe, but compared to David Silva, he's just not as important, because Silva just links absolutely everything together, and when he's not there, there's just this massive hole in how we operate and everything else, he's just, he's a dream. There was a period of time, I don't know if it was last year, but he kind of went off the boil, didn't he? And, he, and, and you guys kind of suffered for it. Yeah, was it? Yeah, he had, a, he had a spell, certainly last year, but he wasn't alone last year. I think there was a lot of discontent in, in the squad, and there was a lot of players whose performances dipped, and he was certainly one of them. Because you look at it last year, our best players were Nastasic, who was a 19-year-old centre-back who was unproven. Zabaleta was player of the year by a mile, and James Milner, they were sort of the three best players. and They're all great players, and we love them. A club like City who've spent as much money as we have on attacking talent, you don't really want your hard workers and your defenders as your best players. So that said a lot to me about what how sort of poor we were last year. And Silva was certainly in that category whereby his performance level was not uh, where we know it can be. But this year he is back to, I think he's better than he was the year we won the title. And the year we won the title, he was absolutely fantastic. And this year, I genuinely believe he's, he's been better. He's added more to his game. Okay. Um, Axe? Yeah, I agree on David Silva. David Silva is probably one of my my, my favourite players outside of Arsenal in the league. Um, and it's amazing that he's, he's he's still behind like a few players in the Spanish squad, which is quite amazing, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's bizarre. It shows the, the the strength of depth they have. But yeah, I mean, Silva's obviously one one we watch for. I mean, it's interesting on Samir Nasri. Um, it's interesting. I think he spoke to your website or your sort of online channel and he was talking about he he expects a bit of a frosty reception and 
You know, and he, he, to be honest, he got it spot on. He, he said that he, he expects a frosty reception because that must mean that the Arsenal fans did love him one day and were disappointed to see him go. And that, that's yeah. exactly it. I think mm-hmm. it hurt Arsenal fans because he finally started to show what sort of player he was. And then obviously we lost him. Uh, but one thing I will say about Stanley and Azri is when things are going well, he's a, he's a great player, you know. But when things start to go a little bit wrong, then that's when, you know, the, the sort of the other, soft, other side of Sammy and Nasri yeah. comes. And it's no, it's, it's no coincidence what you say about him last season when obviously things maybe didn't go as well as you hoped, where yeah. he sort of disappeared in games and, you know, looked a bit you know, unhappy. And, you know, and this year he's obviously looked a lot better. I mean, the little period where you did have, where you were struggling a little bit, he was out for six weeks. So he, he sort of yeah. missed it all together. So... Yeah, it's interesting um, about Sammy Nasri, and he's definitely a player we, you know, we'll we'll be looking out for tomorrow because he is a good player. But yeah, David Silver is the one, and even like Yaya Toure, you know, um, with sort of our midfield, it's we are a bit lightweight at times. Uh, you know, teams. I mean, we saw with Mourinho last week, just sort of threw Matic and Louise there, and basically got them to do a job in our midfield. And I think with Yaya Toure's strengths. He'll have quite a big role tomorrow as well, so I wouldn't be ex- so surprised to see sort of Arteta and Flamini line up. Um, because that's about as solid as we can go. I mean, they're both not the biggest, but you know, at least someone like Flamini will get stuck in, which I think you know he'll need to do against the Ayatore. I think you make a good point, but about Ayatore, but I, I think the player that's underrated is Fernandinho. He's sort of like flown under the radar. I mean, he kind yeah, of does a tidying up work. Us, yeah, yeah he, and he complements Yaya Toure so well. You know, when he's not there, you kind of, I don't know, Yaya doesn't seem to be as effective, maybe because he, he's not so sure that he's got somebody behind him that will sort of tidy up and do all the sort of like, you know, the itty-bitty work. I don't know what you think, Rob. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. If the, if the season stopped now, he would probably be the player of the year. I mean... Him or Silva, basically, would be our player of the year. Fernandinho has just been incredible. Incredible. And the, there was sort of the first three games, he struggled a little bit. And the City fans were being hysterical because we'd paid £30 million and, and they were unsure. And then after about three or four games, he just kicked in. And he has not stopped since. And I completely agree with you that he allows Yaya to do what he does because the, the progression of Yaya Toure since coming to City has been really interesting when you consider he was primarily a sort of number four defensive midfield type player at Barcelona came to us and then started sort of moving forward for the last 20 minutes of games then this year Pellegrini came in and basically said I want to free this guy and I need someone with boundless energy to do it. Gareth Barry, as good a player as he is, and City fans, you will not get a City fan has got a bad word about Gareth Barry, but his legs were creaking at the end of last year. We needed someone to come in and be able to cover so much ground to allow Yaya to go forward, and Fernandinho has done that, and Yaya's got 21 goals in all competitions, which for a midfielder is an incredible haul, is, but uh... Fernandinho allows that to happen. No question. I mean, about it's that. it's very similar to when we had Patrick Vieira. You know, he, he had Silva. He, well, yeah. he had, I was going to say he had Emmanuel Petit before that, yeah. and right, then yeah. Gilberto Silva after. And even you know Edu, Ray Parna, they all sort of, they did the dog work and let let Vieira score. I mean, he never got twenty one goals or anything, but you know he he was able to sort of play. And I think that that's what the sort of and the Neo Yaya Torre uh, partnership's been like. And it also, because it's so solid, it actually lets you play in Aguero and Negredo, whereas you don't, you're not lightweight. I mean, you know, when I think when we came to City, um, you, you went with two strikers, and a lot of people thought you might pack your midfield, you might just play Aguero on his own, but you went with both because you know yeah. you've got the physical sort of Fernandinho and Yaya Torre, and that's, that's such a big, big plus to have. Yeah, up until a couple of weeks ago, we'd only played one system, and that was 4 2 Two, two, which was a system I hadn't seen before Pellegrini came. I mean, I'd seen him do it at Villarreal and whatnot, but in this country, that is the first time I'd seen it. Only in recent weeks have we altered it slightly uh, and gone with one up front, and that's been enforced on us. But it actually works for us. Sometimes it looks like it works better, and the reason being is because when we go with just one man up front, we play Silver just off him. 
So rather than Silva starting from the left and trying to drift in and influence the game, he's starting centrally, right behind the front man, and he's completely free. And from where I'm standing, you should build a side around your best player, and he is our best player. And when he plays that role just off a front man, that's when he does the most damage. So I think we've got a couple of options available to us, and uh, that's, that's obviously really positive for us. How do you think he'll go tomorrow? Do you think he'll, I think he'll, he'll stick with Dzeko? I think, yeah, he'll stick with Dzeko. Dzeko had his best game of the season at Old Trafford, because yeah. Dzeko's a very, very frustrating player, you know. He's clearly very talented, don't get me wrong, and he's clearly, I mean, the stats just back this up completely. He's, he's, he knows where the goal is, you know, he scores goals, but at the same time, he has games where his body language is awful, uh, he cuts a very frustrated figure, and he annoys the City fans. There's no two ways about that. He's a very frustrating player. But you see him on Tuesday night when he has a game like that. He scores a couple of goals and he's running around and he's winning every header and he's holding the ball up and bringing the onrushing midfielders into play. Like Giroud does for, uh, for Arsenal. You just think to yourself, he's a player, this guy. You know, he, he's, he's definitely got something. But he's just very inconsistent. Do you think you'll see him go in the summer, or do you think? I do. There was a bit of talk this summer, wasn't there? And then, yeah, I do think he'll go. But it's interesting. I'm speaking to Richard Jolly, uh, a journalist for the Guardian, and a few other people, and he made a really interesting point about Jacko. He said, "Yeah, it sounds sensible on the surface to say, right, we'll let Jacko go, use that money, put a bit more money to it, maybe, and buy a player we perceive as better. But will that player be?" A, as good a substitute as Dzeko is, and B, too good to think of himself as a substitute and then you end up replacing him 12 months later. Do you know what I mean? Where Dzeko kind of does the yeah, yeah. substitute role and then playing in the first team when he's in mm-hmm. good form. He does that very well. And you could end up where you, in a situation where you think you're getting a better player and, and for all intents and purposes you are getting a better player, but does he suit the role he's going to play in the squad quite yeah. well as Jekko does. So it is, it's an interesting conundrum, really. Well, it's more about what what Jekko wants as well. I think I think City from that side seems like you would love to keep him, but it's whether he's sort of happy because I mean, he, yeah, he's playing at the moment, but as soon as Sergio Aguero's back, that that could change. And even Negredo, Negredo yeah. looked like he was sort of first choice with Aguero. I think he's probably got off the boil, probably first season in the country. He's yeah. starting to feel it a little bit, but you would think. Next season, start of the season again, the Greater will be back in. I mean, yeah, I one agree. Would imagine, so. when, when they're all fit and playing at their best, Jekko is third choice, and yeah. I think he knows that. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see sort of what his thoughts are in the summer. Yeah. Uh, just going on uh, your transfer policy, uh, we were uh, at AST, our own uh, Arsenal Supporters Trust meeting a few weeks ago, and one of, uh, one of the invited guests was saying that, you know, Man City fair financial fair play they could be penalized um i don't know what your 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 financial report says and whether you're towing the line now or whatnot but what's your feeling on the you know because it's it's kicked in already and it's going to become even more stringent going forward Uh, what's your feeling are are man city particularly uh concerned about yeah you know yeah i think we are i think uh this year's figures suggest that we wouldn't have complied with it completely, if if my understanding of it is correct. But the improvement on the year before was clear for everybody to see. Our uh, income, based on sort of commercial uh, aspects and European involvement and match day revenue, etc., is growing all the time. And if you look at the players we brought in last summer, okay, we went out and spent sort of £95 million again, which is a lot of money. But the contracts that these players are on, if you compare them to the contracts we were handing out in the Mark Hughes era, there's a clear shift. I mean, we brought in Cheeky Bigiristain and Ferran Soriano, who are the two um, Barcelona directors who who were part of the Juan Laporta um, takeover in 2003 when the whole success kicked off at Barca and they've come to City and since they've come there's been clear changes in all sorts of things and one of them is this area um, so whereas we were handing out sort of £150,000 a week contracts under Hughes we're now sort of handing out 80000 to the likes of Negredo and Navas and I think that's the future and I think all the time the wage bill they're going to try and bring the wage bill down at the same time as increasing revenue all the time and 
they think they're on course to comply with it within a couple of years. I mean, how stringently it's going to be applied anyway will be very interesting because I'm just not convinced. Maybe I'm being yeah. naive, but I'm just not convinced at the moment that it's going to be, uh, you know, the sanctions are going to be that stringently applied. It definitely seems like, you know, if, if you're in the club, you're all right. <laughs> you know, it's those that are not in the yeah. in the club that yeah. are going to find it difficult to, to you know, to um, make the adjustments and, 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 and sort of penetrate into that sort of uh, fraternity of, of, of elite clubs. Well, this is it. I mean, the absurdity of FFP is, it, it, to where I'm standing, surely it cements the status quo as it is now. So... If you remember, like a few years ago, it was the top when we used to have the top four in quotes, which was Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal, United, and everyone was saying how boring it was. It was the same four every year, and then City came along, and because of the sort of external investment, managed to break in there and mix it up a little bit, and then suddenly nobody liked that. And FFP, if this comes in, it's just going to make it so difficult for somebody else to ever rise up the league and sort of break in and it also contravenes European law as well surely every other business in Europe uh, is allowed an investor to invest to seek growth in the future and yeah. I don't understand why football I mean I get it to a certain degree because you know I do I do sort of understand the reasons but at the same time I also think it, it's slightly odd at the same time I'm a little bit torn on the issue really is yeah. what I'm I, I think it's definitely it's a different it's, a, it's a probably an issue a topic for another podcast but you know there's this you've got owners like Abramovich and uh, the, you, you, Abu Dhabi and so on that are, you know that know what they're doing and then you've got people like you know uh, well you had is it Wacko Thacko before before um, the Abu Dhabi guys came oh, in. Oh, Taxi Shinarashri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, he could, is in prison, could, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Oh. You know, he could have taken you under. You had Carson Young, who's just been, you know, um, imprisoned. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Italian guy at, at, at Leeds, Leeds who, who, yeah. who, who failed. And obviously the biggest one is Portsmouth, who, who might go out of the league now, yeah. you know, for mismanagement. So it's it's a difficult it's a difficult one, to, and I think it boils down to the fit and proper test, yeah, fit and proper person's test. But that you know, clearly uh, isn't that, that that clearly doesn't work. The fit and proper mm. person's test does it because, like you say, you've just named a list of people there who, surely to God, would fail any sensible fit and proper person's test. So yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know. FFP. I'm just me. I mean, it's uh, as a city fan, it's difficult to argue against FFP without sounding like you're only arguing it to um, protect your own interests. But at the same time, I, I do think that there is an element of it's just going to surely cement whoever is in sort of Champions League uh, club now is going to make it more and more difficult for anybody to come in and dislodge those people. Hmm. Those two. Indeed. I just want to ask you before we move on, um, you've got a lot of money, you've had a lot of money come in Um with this this investment and the commercial deals was I don't know how you did it, but somehow you got you managed to make it seem all right that your 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 owners were allowed to you know sell you some commercial rights or something like that. I'm not sure how that worked, but what I want to ask you is has has this sort of influx of money um, compromised your ability to produce your own homegrown players? Because Man City did have a long tradition of bringing it. I remember in the early 90s you had David White, and yeah. was it David, David and Paul, Paul White and uh, Ricky Lake or somebody Lake, Paul Lake, and you had a, you had a group of young players, um, and you've always had that until recently. I think the last person I re remember was Michael Johnson, but he's sort of like bloated. He's, you know, he's yeah, he, gone off the rails. Yeah, that was, he, he sort of ruined his own career. He was the most talented as well of in the last 15 years of all the ones we brought through. Because we brought through a few, right? Phillips, Barton, um, Michael, Michael Richards. Michael Johnson, Michael Richards. Yeah. Michael Richards yeah. is the only one who actually made was good enough to make the leap into mm. the post-shake, you know, the, the Shake Mansour era kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, what basically my take on that is this. When the money came in and we suddenly uh, sort of turbocharged on in terms of the quality of our first team, there was bound to be a few years where the, the youth players were lagging behind and were going to struggle to get uh, into the first team. I just think that was a natural thing. But what's... Um, pleasing me is that clearly the club are very keen on 
rectifying that. I mean, this summer we're opening uh, an 80-acre site <coughs> which is adjacent to the Etihad, and it's called the Etihad Campus, and it's linked with a bridge to the to the main um, stadium. And it's world-class facilities. Everybody at the club is going to be housed there, from commercial media staff, uh, directors, everybody, to the un- uh, under fives right up to the first team. You know, we're talking pitches for kids, just pitches for goalkeepers, pitches for the reserve and the youth teams, for the women's team, just absolutely everything all on one massive state-of-the-art site. And again, going back to the two Barcelona guys, their dream is to see City completely self-sufficient and producing their own players in the same way that Barcelona did. So it's going to take time, but clearly the club, I mean, it's cost £100 million to open this thing. I mean, if that is not a, a signal um, of intent on, on the part of the owners that we want to produce our own players in the future, then I don't know what is. Um, I just think that people need to give us a little bit of time because, as I tried to explain a moment ago, when when that initial investment comes and you're suddenly buying players that are sort of three or four times the quality that you've currently got, yeah, there's going to be a few years where your youth team players are going to struggle to get break in. We need to sort of bring our youth development uh, set up to the same level of quality as the first team. And that's just going to take a few years, but it's, I think it'll happen. I genuinely believe that. Cool. All right, Axe, you got any questions? Um, oh, that's a little bit of a random one, actually. You know, Man City have their tunnel cam. Yeah. I think it's something Liverpool tried for a bit as well, but I think they, they, they sort of took it away or they don't publicise it and stuff like that. I mean, do you know how that all came about? And it, it's something I find fascinating. I must admit, I, when Arsenal come there, I do, do tend to watch it and I watch <laughs> it. And I've, I've always found it quite interesting as well. I think um, it's great. Yeah, I yeah, love it. Is that something, obviously fans, fans enjoy it and stuff. Um, I mean, do you know much about how that came well, about? Ba- I mean, basically, we've got a really young media team at City, and I think, reading between the lines, I think initially that was a cost-cutting idea. So you get okay. rid of you get rid of really experienced journalists, replace them with younger people who are, Interns. who are a bit cheaper, basically. <laughs> but obviously, yeah. there are benefits that come with that as well, because you know, young people have. Great new ideas. ideas, yeah, yeah, new ideas, and they've all come in and they said, why don't we do this, and the video content, and blah, 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 and then we sort of made it all free, because we were so wealthy, I think that the owners knew that there had to be some token things in there yeah. to say, look, we're not taking the piss here, you know, basically. So, yeah, I think it was a combination of those two things, this sort of new, young team that was put together, and this sort of budget that they had. Um, and it just all these ideas came together, and Tom yeah. Camp was one of them, and it was it proved really popular. Not so much the people don't seem to talk about it as much anymore. It's interesting you've mentioned it, but when it first came about, so you know, Twitter and even my mates, you know, and stuff like that, were just all, "Did you see this Tom Camp? Did you see that?" And uh, it's it's a really nice insight into the day, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, in the head when you signed Sammy and Nasri, they had his sort of first day. Uh, they had cameras following him about as well because there was a lot of talk we into all yeah. that in the Arsenal circles that he was sort of welcomed by Patrick Vieira in the offices and then I think the first player he saw was Colo Torre so yeah. it was a little bit like it just looked like it was Arsenal but yeah. you know a few years a few years before that um, that, that, that sort of video has been really useful well, to going back to the Mancini Pellegrini handover when I said to you that the, there was a, an issue with, from the club's point of view whereby the, the fans loved Mancini, but they had to replace him with this new guy, the video of Pellegrini's first day really helped turn people's opinion. Not completely, obviously, one yeah. video was not going to do that, but there'd been all this anger and uproar. And then there was this video of him arriving at the airport looking cool. Then he cracked a joke with John Gadetti, one of our young players, and really made him feel good, and that was caught on video. And then there was him going through all the pro zone uh, analysis stats and, and all this kind of... And all of a sudden, you turn on Twitter the next minute after that video has gone live, and everyone's saying, oh, you know what, actually, I quite like this guy. So from yeah. a PR point of view, it can work. You know, you can make things like that really work for, for your benefit. Yeah. Yeah, because exactly, it give, as you said, it gives you such an insight. I mean, it, it, that's one thing I've found that, you know, you 
You, I mean, <laughs> I think the sort of English mentality is always to be in the tunnel, not look at the opposition. You know, not you're not friends, you're sort of enemies for 90 minutes. But you see all the sort of foreign lads. I think, <laughs> yeah. If I remember right, it's Hansen Kazola and David Silva were giving each other about 69 kisses, and <laughs> it was just like you know, it was yeah. it was actually slightly you were thinking oh. No wonder, you know, there was nine goals in the game and, you know, it was all friendly because look at them in the tunnel. But, yeah, I mean, you know, like, that's not like the Keenan Vieira days. That's right. right. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, you know, that was totally different, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. that was sort of, that was just a different era. But, um, yeah, no, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm curious to see if other clubs sort of take it on and stuff as well. Um, I think but, yeah. Some, some clubs are funnier, aren't they? Like, United are very, very funny about who they let in for a start like to give you an example websites no matter how big the website if you're just a website and not a newspaper and a website you can't go to the pre-match conf- press conference on a Friday uh, they're very funny about who they let in and they're also funny about the content they didn't have a Twitter account until the start of this season which interestingly coincided with Ferguson leaving so you can make yeah. your, you can yeah. make your own mind up about who <laughs> decided that and also video content because there was actually an incident wasn't there I'm trying to think of it when, when City played United earlier this year there was an it's incident with Giggs tunnel. yeah was it yeah. right Giggs the referee or something was caught on camera and United sent a formal complaint to the Premier League and basically said we're not sure that this is okay yeah it was your player cam it was I think it was could have been Giggs but it was basically going down the tunnel asking the referee something and I think he was slightly aggressive I yeah. think that that then was on your YouTube channel, and yeah, that that caused problems. I think. Yeah. So, so. whether whether clubs are cautious about things, our club they just seem to be gung ho where that's concerned. And like I say, I think that the the head of media at City uh, is a woman who's been there for years, and I think she just said to her team, "If you've got ideas, run with them." And it's yeah. like literally, I think that is sort of where this is all coming from: is this sort of young team who are free to really express themselves and make their own decisions. Yeah, I mean it's totally different at Arsenal, where it, it's a lot more strict. I mean, you know, players sort of are kept sort of under wraps a little bit. Uh, you know, they're not. You know, even with interviews, I mean, it, it's often you see the same players giving interviews. You know, the sort of players that Arsenal think are safe um, even yeah. sort of requesting in sort of I think we, we have I mean we, we don't really have an end of season awards or anything like that the only thing our clubs will do is we do a charity ball at the end of the season and that's sort of a bit of a night out for the players and stuff like that but apart from that there's not really much at Arsenal it's all kept I think Wenger's quite Strict. I'm not sure he's a Fergie in terms of, you know, sort of banning journalists and banning websites and stuff. I think in press conference wise, I think, I think most people are allowed to come. Um, yeah, that's, but, that's what a lot of people have told me about Arsenal, that they are actually quite welcoming of the journalists. And I think that brings benefits. I really do. I think that since City have started treating their journalists really well, like the food at City for the journalists is amazing. Like, you would watch, you read any match report of City and the journalists always get a line in there about how the food was fantastic again and whatnot. Yeah. It's like become a bit of a running joke. And, and you see that the more we've sort of done for the journalists, the less of the hatchet jobs have, have been, been out there. Because we had a period when we handed over from Mark Hughes to Mancini where we were getting the worst media coverage you could possibly imagine. And now... Yeah people who were writing hatchet jobs then wouldn't dream of doing it now so I think there are benefits that you've got to get strike the balance obviously you don't want sort of open season and we have got you know we don't want secrets getting out and whatnot but at the same time if you sort of treat the media with contempt and suspicion you're going to get a bit back so that you've yeah. got to get the balance right and I think Arsenal from what I've heard I mean I don't know too much but from what I've heard from sort of um, people who sit with me in the media section at City for the odd game here and there and you get chatting about other clubs Arsenal are one of the ones that the journalists all really appreciate the way that they treat them yeah exactly I mean I, I've actually been to a few um, um, press conferences I, I was actually doing a little bit of work with the Mirror as well a few years ago um, and, and I mean Arsene Wenger seems to he seems to know every journalist who was there he seems to know their name he knew everything about them he actually made eye contact with me a fair few times during the press conference because it was obviously a new face and I think yeah. that's something a lot of people have said that he does seem to know I mean there's, there's one chap who's from I think Japan um, he 
he's there pretty much every press conference. He only has one question. It's right at the end. He always asks about Rio Miyachi. Uh, for obviously their fans yeah, in, in yeah. Japan and, and Arsenal you know it, it doesn't change much we, I mean actually he's nowhere near the first team squad so even when he's fit he's not going to play but yeah. I mean you know Arsenal Wenger is always very respectful answers the question and then it sort of it, it's become I think a bit of a running joke and I think the guy he laughs himself when he asks <laughs> about that but he's obviously under pressure from his editors to ask about Rio Miyachi but That's I mean brilliant. you know stuff like that is brilliant yeah he's a super intelligent man though isn't he Wenger and that I don't just mean sort of in terms of football tactics and, or reading books or whatever. I mean in, in sort of everything. He's a very emotionally intelligent person as well. So the fact that he knows everybody and knows everything about them the yeah. this does not surprise me about yeah. it. I mean, what what is sorry? Just I know we're sort of running out of time, but what is sort of your view, your personal view, and maybe what you think Man City fans do think of Wenger? I mean, considering last week we had his thousand game, and you yeah. know there was a lot of tributes coming in. Well, what's what's your view? I, I don't know what other City fans think. I really don't. I think his his reputation has sort of suffered, hasn't it, in the general um, in in general over the last few years? But for me, I just think he's a genius, and I just if I was an Arsenal fan, you would not hear. Discontent from I me. Mean, not, I'm not saying he's uncriticisable. That's ridiculous. Of course he is. But mm. the sort of Wenger out things, I, honestly, I cannot get my head around them. Like the guy has taken you through a period where you've had to pay off a stadium. And yeah. You've qualified for the Champions League every year in that period, and now you've got all this money. Someone you're going to reap the benefit of that at some point. And yeah. this guy has made that happen through being. One, a tactical genius. Two, a transfer market genius. But also just a fantastic manager. And I just, yeah, I, I've got nothing but admiration for, for Arsene Wenger. I think he's, uh, I think he's a, a brilliant man. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what, what most people think. I mean, he, he's certainly a stubborn man as well. He, he certainly, you yeah. know, if, if, if there's a player he's not sure about, I mean, there's been a few in the past, you know, the one matters and he sort of, he will dither a little bit and may just think, you know what, they're not the right man. Maybe they're not the right per player for us. And I think that's where, I mean, I, I personally sort of back Arsene Wenger and I hope he does stay on and sign a new contract. Because as you sort of say, I think he has taken us through the sort of mean years, you know, when financially there were big constraints, uh, a brand new spanking stadium, which obviously links into FFP. Um, and I think now it's probably his chance to, I think he deserves to spend it. But I mean, yeah. a lot a lot of people will then ask that, well, will he spend it? I mean, that that's, you know, he did Find Mesut Ozil last year, but will he spend it? I mean, you know, we're sort of crying out for a big striker this summer, so I think it's, if he does stay, it's going to be a big one there to see if he just does land his sort of big marquee striker because I think, you know, something like that would just suddenly make fans, even the ones who are slightly unsure, maybe just give him sort of, you know, another season or two to prove himself. The impression. Uh, Go on, go on. Sorry, go on, go on. one go more on, thing on Wenger. The impression I get with him is that if you replaced him, I think a lot of your fans would suddenly think, well, actually, he was better than I thought. I think you'd end up in a situation where you'd have somebody new and you would realise the qualities, maybe some of the qualities that Wenger's got that don't get discussed quite as much as maybe they should do, suddenly would be really underlined and highlighted. That's my reading of it. Mm. Uh, my, 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 I think for me, uh, money's one thing, and I think a lot of people keep keep censoring their argument around money. For me, uh, it's it's the inf- the seeming inf- seemingly inflexibility of his tactics. I mean, you know, um, we're playing a formation that's three years out of date. That was che- that was a chess a chess Fabregas formation. He's been gone three years. We're still playing that formation. You know, he doesn't. You know, we we want to see that you know we we, we are tailoring our, our 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 tactics for the opposition. I mean, obviously, you want to concentrate on your own your own strengths, but you can't in this modern day, in this game, in the modern game now, you can't you can't go into matches believing that our quality is great, our our quality will win the day. Yeah, it just doesn't work like that. No, anymore. I agree with you that. Said, I you, agree. You with said that. you said that um, you know Pellegrini recently changed into a four two two two. Yeah, you know, formation. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be flexible. Yeah. There has to be that flexibility in your game. Um, and and also after your, I remember um, after just after the Man United victory, he was asked a question. He said, "Look, 
you have many games in a season. You need a big squad. You need a squad that can manage, those, you know, uh, playing in, domestically, playing in free cup competitions. You know, it's it's it, you can't do it with a core of nineteen players. You know, and then add add. At the, the you know the under twenty ones here and there you you can't do it squad is good and uh, like I said a few, you know, a, a few moments ago so that's my problem with Wenger money the fact that he's led us through a period of austerity is great um, if he shows that he is tactically flexible I wouldn't have a problem him staying on another season but I don't know but that's 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 for another that's for another thing with you I want to ask you uh, Rob um, how do you I mean, what, what, what's what's Patrick Vieira's role? Because we we were we were spitting blood. We couldn't believe it when he went to Man City. We couldn't believe it when he, <laughs> he gave him a job as ambassador or whatever. Now he's head of youth development. We were like, he's he's got to be here. He's got to be at Arsenal. This yeah. is where he, this is his home. I mean, what, what kind of job is he doing there? Is it, you know, what, what's he doing? Give, give us an impression of what you've, of what you've, you've missed a done. trick. You've missed a trick because to have him involved is just. I, I sometimes you know we have to pinch ourselves and we've got one of the Premier League greats involved I mean basically the story is Brian Marwood he came in obviously for initially for six months as a player ended up doing 18 months and then at the end of it Brian Marwood who gets a lot of criticism because you know Mancini turned a lot of the fans against him with it with trickery here and there but Brian Marwood spotted the potential and said give him an ambassador role first of all just get him involved and from there his remit is now huge he is basically the man at the head of youth football right across the club and that is obviously with a view of trying to send some of these young players into the first team he'll probably manage City one day uh, well I wouldn't say well, hey hey okay. hold on ok I won't right, say yeah. I won't say probably but it wouldn't <laughs> okay, be a bit excited there it wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me honest to God it would not because Was the he? way the way the Barcelona guys work is they, they do put a point from within and they do, I mean the word holistic again, they want someone who knows the club and they can see they've got Vieira in this role, his remit has grown year on year, I mean next year when the Etihad campus opens and if he's in charge of youth, uh, the whole of youth football at City then, I mean he's going to be, he's got a big job on his hands, you know, making that transition and everything else, so he, his role he, is big. Um, Do you think he's got the makings of a manager? Do you think well, he's yeah, he's managing the EDS side at the moment, and they're doing quite well, and I think everyone's at the club's really impressed with the way he's operating in that role. And, uh, you know, whisper it, but I've had a few murmurs, shall we say, that it wouldn't surprise people within the club, and it wouldn't surprise me, if one day he did manage, I'm not saying he is going to, or they've got plans to, I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that, but I'm just saying I wouldn't be shocked. Genuinely. Well then, we just hope, <laughs> hope, we just hope his heart will then tell him to, you know, if there is a job at Arsenal, to, <laughs> to, to come maybe with Dennis Burkamp as his assistant. And, yeah, um, no, that would be the dream Arsenal days. team, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was rumours when he, when he was an ambassador, or when he, maybe started his youth role, that he was all practically on players' wages because there was a lot of, obviously, pressure on sort of Arsenal to think, well, why isn't there sort of a job there? And I think it sort of came out somewhere or another that, well, financially, Arsenal just couldn't compete by paying yeah. someone that much money. I'm not sure if there's any truth in that at all. Um, it wouldn't just, surprise me. They absolutely yeah. love him. Honestly, yeah. everybody at that club loves Patrick Vieira. I mean, I've met him a couple of times and you, couldn't, you could not meet a nicer guy He's very uh, charming, isn't he? he? he oh, he is just, he's got time for everybody, he is yeah. polite, he's charming, he's a re he treats everybody, from what I can make out from my brief interactions with him, he treats everybody the same, and that is yeah. such a, a brilliant thing, and I just think he's so well respected by absolutely everybody, the two Barcelona guys love him, Brian Marwood loves him, the head of media loves him, all the big names within the club really admire what Patrick Vieira brings uh, I can yeah. I can assure you of that. Yeah. He was like that at Arsenal too as a player. I met him a few times. And actually, when we came to the Etihad, we just sort of a little story. But we as we got out of our sort of cab from the station, and uh, we had to sort of walk round and where where your car park is. Patrick Vieira and his wife and his I think daughter was getting out of the car. So there was about four or five of us, and we, we obviously started singing his name. And you could tell he, he was sort of a special game, because obviously Man City, his current employers against Arsenal, his former employers, it was special for him. And we, we sort of walked fast, and we did catch up with him, and, you know, he was still pleasant then. And I think for a second we were so excited, we 
to sort of see Patrick Vieira again, we sort of forgot where we were. And then there was a moment where we sort of looked around and we're right in the home end with Man City fans all around us. And there's like four of us going, Vieira, whoa. And then we, we sort of slowly just, we, we saw a copper and we just sort of went behind him and carried on walking back to the away end. But, you know, it's, he's respected here just as much. I mean, everyone here loves him. He was sort of, you know, he, he sort of defended our club on the pitch for us. You know, when, when sort of... Roy Keane or maybe some like Gary Neville tried to, you know, kick Jose Antonio Reyes back to Spain. It was, it was, uh, Patrick Vieira really, you know, stood up for him, stood up for the club. Every sort of game where you knew, all right, we're going to be in a battle here, you know, Patrick Vieira, you want him on your side sort of thing. He was the one who will fight for the club. Um, you know, he will always speak passionately. He was a great player. He was a great captain. I mean, since Tony Adams would probably arguably had one very good captain and that was Patrick Vieira and um, you know he, 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 I think it hurts us it certainly hurts me he's one of probably my all time best players in my sort of 20-25 years of watching Arsenal as well he's yeah. certainly my best all time player um, yeah. and it's just a shame he's, he's a Premier League great isn't he I mean, oh absolutely literally, if, you, if you were to list the best players who'd played in the Premier League he, he couldn't be lower than five for anybody surely yeah, especially the longevity. I mean, he came in '96, so he was sort of here in the early days when perhaps there wasn't as many foreign foreigners around here. So he had to sort of adapt to with that. And not only that, he was he was a young foreigner. Up until Very then, we've been getting a lot of old foreigners who were collecting their pensions, weren't yeah. they? And he, and he started. He had a tough start. You know, he was getting sent off a lot. He had disciplinary problems. Um, so he did go through you know hard times but yeah. you know he came through it so fair play to him mm-hmm. hopefully we'll see him back one day no offence yeah. Robert <laughs> <laughs> ok Rob before we wrap it up I, I want to ask you who do you see as Arsenal's main threats to Man City uh, uh, player wise um, I like Cazorla I must admit I like him I think he's a good player although he's not been quite as good this season as like I don't know what your take on that is um, obviously Mesut Ozil as well I think I don't think he's playing oh, he's 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 injured, not, yeah. is he yeah. right I mean that, that, that's probably the problem I think the players that have played well against you someone like Theo Walcott you I was going to say he's the one yeah, and he, he's out. highlighted yeah Walcott because he's just I, I, I remember when he was. You offered him the new contract because he, his contract was very close to running out, wasn't it? And yeah. You offered him the new one of hundred thousand yeah. pound a week, and people, yeah. on, people on Twitter were saying like, "What are Arsenal doing?" I was like, "What?" Arsenal I, fans were asking, "What are Arsenal doing?" Well, I just could not understand <laughs> it. I'm thinking one hundred thousand pounds about standard for a decent player these days, anyway. Not at Arsenal, it's not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, our, our wage mm. structure is very different to yours. Yeah, um, actually, yeah. I've just shown myself up for being a, a City fan now. I've heard really. <laughs> but, <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah I mean, it's only a hundred grand, you know. Well, it's only a hundred. We'll pay him Manu Adebay or two hundred grand, no problem. <laughs> but I looked at him and I just thought the guy's got pace to burn. He'd started scoring goals at that stage as well. Like he'd added goals to his game, and I just remember thinking, well, you know, like I don't, I can't, I can't understand what the problem is really. The guy, he looks like a quality player, and he's, I think he's really proved that, hasn't he? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so, that's yeah. the problem. We are missing. I mean, along with Aaron Ramsey, Walcott, uh, they'll, that's, that's a lot of players. I mean, just to give you probably uh, uh, how we'll line up tomorrow. You think I mean, Olivier Giroud will probably start unless he goes the Ayas and no go, which he did against Bayern Munich. So you never know. Um, and then there's I quite like Giroud. I must admit, I know he gets a stick for not necessarily scoring a load of goals, but I actually think he does a decent job. Yeah, he's just been disappointing in big games. You know, he's a bit of a bully against the smaller teams, but in the big games, he's just, you know, has, I don't think he's ever scored against City, Chelsea, or Man United. So I mean, he, he does need to add goals in the big games. I mean. They'll, they'll be Podolski, Rosicki, Cazola, Ch- okay. Chamberlain. Chamberlain Thanks. might be. Chamberlain might be a threat. He's a very good player. I think he Knox, I think he's he's got the makings of being an excellent player. I really do. He's not there yet, and he's he's you know he's sort of a you know he's got areas of his game to work on. But you look at him sometimes. I know he had like a shocking ten or fifteen minutes, didn't he, the other week or whatever. But he, you look at him sometimes with his raw pace and strength and whatnot, and I just think there's, there's definitely a player there. Um, he he could be good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Mm. I was going to ask you if you were if you were paid to be a kind of a secret agent for Arsenal Football Club, Rob, and you were trying to give a dossier on on on, on uh, Man City, where would you say Man City's weak points are? Oof, um, where would you exploit? Left back, we struggle a little bit um, for sure, and also just defensively in general, I think that's where we're weaker. I think that you know you, you, if you get at us. Um, you know, we can be ruffled, shall we say, um, because that's where we're, we're certainly not as strong at the back as we are going forward. So, yeah, I don't know, really. I'd say, yeah, left back, we're not great. We've not got a proper partner for company either. So, defensively, we're not. But he's like three defenders in one, isn't he? He's like, you know, he is really. He's a colossus, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's probably the best individual defender in the league. I'd say Chelsea yeah. are the be- got the best back four and defend the best as a team, but he's the best individual yeah. defender. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that City have the best 11, but it's marginal. I think that Chelsea have the best defence. I think Liverpool have the best attack, certainly at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but I think overall we have the best 11, but only marginally. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's why the race has become tighter than I think. I think a lot of people thought we were going to run away with it, didn't they, early in the season when, uh, you know, we were scoring goals for fun or whatnot, that period where we we, we beat you guys at home. Um, but it's just not quite turned out like that because, yeah, we've got weaknesses that weren't being shown quite as uh, clearly back then. Interesting. Okay. All right. So let's get your predictions, Rob. Um, Scoreline uh, for tomorrow? I think we're going to win. I must admit, I do. Uh, really? Yeah. I think really? So. You've got a hunch, have you? <laughs> I think City are going to win. So I'll say, I'll try, what did I say on the, my podcast last night? Because uh, I should be consistent, really, shouldn't I, with my prediction? No, I can't remember. I'll, th- I'll go for 2 1 City. Very kind of you. Yeah. Very really kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Ax. Uh, um, well, uh, I made some predictions before the Chelsea game and they were absolutely horrid. Um, uh, oh, um, I, I just don't know. You know, I think the first goal was key. Uh, if we get the first goal, you never know. We could fluke something if City can get it. I think they could potentially run away with it. Um, uh, uh, you know, I've got to try and be a bit positive, you know, it, it's, <laughs> otherwise, what's the point of going tomorrow? So let's just say, let's say Arsenal to nick it 2-1. Do I really believe that's going to happen? Probably not, but you never know. It's going to 2-1 Arsenal. All right. Well, PMA for me. Um, so let's keep it within two, you know. <laughs> 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 that's all I hope for you can never predict football though you can never predict football but I'll tell you that's what, why we like it isn't it Cause yeah that is it and that's why it causes so much debate and you know well, it's, it's, we it's, certainly it's, didn't like it last week well I'll tell you what <laughs> <laughs> seeing, seeing the away in that Stanford Bridge that, that wasn't pretty I'll tell you that <laughs> oh dear alright great stuff right, Rob listen uh, thanks for coming on it's been great pleasure speaking to you yeah thank you very much for having me I've really enjoyed it no worries, no worries. And um, good luck for the rest of the season as well. Thank you very just much. Not, just not tomorrow. Obviously. Just not tomorrow. I always say that. Yeah, just not for tomorrow. Yeah. All right. So um, time to wrap it up now. Um, it's been, uh, this has been Giles alongside Akil. Akil, so good night. Yep, good night. Come and on, Rob. <laughs> and Rob. Good night. And that's um, been a Guna Ramble and IFT, an AFTV podcast. Thank you and good night. One, two, two, three.